Good morning. And howdy. I would like to start by congratulating David and Saki for a well thoughtful uh, plan and, and uh, really looking forward to the discussions that, that, that follow. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the uh, what's happening in the world of the water and energy food nexus. If I have to pick a location where the water energy food nexus is most relevant, it probably, out of the whole areas we could be working on, it would be Texas. Uh, uh, the the uh, Representative King mentioned this morning in his, in his opening the competition of water between the various sectors, where we'd, how would we manage our water, how would we allocate our water, how would we allocate between the various com competing uh, factors. And I think uh, whatever we will, we're doing here in the state uh, in terms of managing these precious primary resources is not going to only help us in the state, but it's going to help worldwide. Uh, the problems we're facing here are, uh, are, are very uh, worldwide, of worldwide importance. I'd like maybe to start with who we are. Uh, and, and share with you a few benchmarks of the drivers of the future agenda in terms of sustainability. And the irony is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here, focusing on Texas, resonate with many parts of the world. Uh, some of the situation analysis in water and food. Uh, and I'd like to maybe propose some new ways for agriculture and water management that we could be uh, a leading platform and share a nexus because it is about trade-off. It is about how we manage these resources in a holistic uh, platform. I'll share with you some of the work we're doing there in that area and then some closing. We are the Water Energy Food Nexus Research Group. We also have recently launched the Water Energy Food Nexus Initiative, which is a statewide initiative. And a lot of what this group is doing is a building platforms for trade-off analyses and for looking at the interlinkages between water energy and food. We also focus on the water food part of this nexus. And I'd like maybe to a, to a small extent, this is not about hydrology, but I'll, I'd like to propose some green water management that, that we need. In one of the visits, I was actually flying internationally and I, I happened to be sitting next to the, next to me from Carlos Station to Dallas, a farmer from Lubbock. And he was forthcoming saying you guys need to help us because we, we don't have more than five, ten years of rain fed, of, of irrigated agriculture in the Lubbock area. And I think there's a lot of things we could do to help these farmers maintain their resilience and, and improve their resilience in terms of uh, productivity. And I'd like to, to propose a few things uh, in terms of green water accounting and some of the uh, new water that uh, we, we have. Uh, that also brings us to uh, low, some of the impact that we need, need to be looking at. Uh, we're the first to uh, have a course on the water and energy food nexus, Texas A&M, uh, specifically the biological and agricultural engineering. So we have uh, some uh, expertise in that area that uh, I hope we we can communicate that further because that course is online or is expected to be one of those online courses. Uh, I did mention that Texas A&M University launched the Water and Energy Food Nexus Initiative to really bring about all of these silos into a same platform and to allow us to respond to these grand challenges in a more coordinated way. So what's happening in the world around us? I picked this from one of the magazines uh, uh, a, about a year ago. In fact, it was almost a year ago when I picked this up. And it's not specifically meant for Texas, but Texas has, we, we do have a big share of that. If you look at the, the gas, shale gas boom, uh, as was uh, mentioned earlier this morning by, by, by President F. King, a lot of that shale gas is in the Eagle Ford. And the shale gas will, become one of the major natural gas products, and it will become a huge major portfolio in our energy security, which is wonderful. However, 
as was also indicated by Representative King, it has some implication on the water security. So this is one of the drivers that we need to look at when it comes to the nexus and the allocation between water among these various uh, stakeholders. Population growth, we don't know, we don't know, predict the future, but, but as Representative King mentioned, this is a good assumption. We will be hitting almost 50 million in the state of Texas by 2060, which is a major stress and uh, uh, major uh, component that we, we, we need to be looking at when it comes to the, the uh, uh, competing stakeholders for water. These people need to have their domestic water and that water is a limited supply, as, as you mentioned. The other driver that I would like to mention, this came from the IPCC report, the last report, and out of the many dimensions that we could focus on, I'd like to focus on two dimensions of that report, which is the impact on both river flows and soil moisture. These two are the hard core of agriculture. So if you look at river flows, most of our water supply comes from surface water. Yes, we do pump a little bit, but a lot of the majority of our water supply, especially for domestic, comes from surface water, rivers and lakes. And the soil moisture reduction, as it's being projected, at least in this part of the US and this part of the world, a reduction in soil moisture directly relates to our food security. Two thirds of our food comes from rain fed agriculture. So less soil moisture would certainly mean a risk in terms of the securing the food that we have. So this is, these are two major stresses among the other stresses and it's, I thought it's very relevant to the conference themes as we look into climate change impact on agriculture and the sustainability of the agriculture and water. So yes, we do have some regions of the world that would have more flow, but we are in a part of the world that will be receiving less, less flow. So, if I focus on the water demand supply picture, as we see it here in Texas, the majority of the water will still be agriculture. But the bad news is the allocation, the projected allocation, we would have a dwindling supply for fresh water that will be available for agriculture. And yet, our population is going to almost double, which means that we will have to almost double our food supply on a less water. The majority of the growth of the water supply that we will have will go into domestic because of the population increase. Energy, at least business as usual, will maintain that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the energy uh, use. So let me talk about energy use in two different occasions. One in the electricity generation. And that's a significant amount of our water goes into electricity generation. And that's distributed throughout the state. However, if we look at the hydraulic fracturing, even though it may be a small portion of our water supply statewide, that happens to be very localized, both in time and space. That induces a very shock stress on those communities that are in that area. So even though it may not, be cons it may not constitute a large portion of our water supply. However, it's a significant water supply at the location in the Eagle Ford area, in those communities, and it happens in a very short period of time. So those dimensions cannot be ignored and should, should be highlighted as, as we, we talk about the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the demand supply. So if we put all of these together, we have a 40% projected water gap in a business as usual scenario in the state of Texas. And guess what? If you look at the global statistics, it's also 40% water gap in the next, by 2060. So whatever, whatever has happened here at home in the state of Texas has been resonating with what's happening globally. And the, the rest of the talk of my intervention on the nexus, I'd like to focus on this 40%. How do we come up with plans? The, the uh, uh, Representative King this morning mentioned conservation. And yes, conservation is one of the main areas that we need to focus on, but there may be other areas that I'd like also to highlight. And if I'd like to mention one thing about the difference between this community, the water, food, agriculture community, who focuses on conservation as compared to the energy community that does not focus on that issue. 
And, and I think this is a very, in terms of, I mean, we had a, the impact survey a few years ago, surveyed over a thousand stakeholders. And this is a very loud and clear message that while we focus on conservation and using less, the energy community does not do that. And there's a growth there because of the, 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 the association between economic development and energy use. Somehow we need to break that cycle, but this is the situation that we, we have today. So I'd like to focus the rest of the uh, uh, intervention this morning on how do we bring about this 40% water gap. So 60% of our water supply is for the state of Texas, focusing on the state of Texas, will have to come from conventional sources. This is groundwater, this is surface water, those conventional sources that we are familiar with. 24%, this, these are all projected, 24% is coming from conservation. There's about 16% that will come from non-conventional water sources, what I'm calling new water. That's from reuse, desalination, from wastewater. And by the way, if you are visiting Washington, D.C., in some of these circles in the water energy nexus discussion, which is happening quite a bit, they, there's a new term for wastewater facilities. Those are energy recovery units. So they're no longer, which is, we, and, and I kept telling them, this is something that we've done in the ag community many, many years ago. But there's a new term for these wastewater facilities as energy recovery units, where, uh, uh, which is great. So they, they, they woke up to what this community has been doing for many years. So I'd like to focus on this 16% reuse and desalination because it does have a lot of impact that we need to be looking at. So the new water would have a 16% role in bridging that 40% water gap. And it's been very much in the minds of the, as you know, the state of Texas has 16 regional planning groups. 14 of them recommended the reuse. The question is for us, the, the, the science and, and the R&D community is how and where, and also, looking at what are the implications and, or, and what are the, the, uh, some of the consequences. So I'd like maybe uh, uh, to a very brief extent talk about green water management. Green water management is that water that agriculture folks have known this for, for many, many, many years. However, and I can tell you that if you go into green water literature, we've done this and there are five different definitions. If we cannot define it, we cannot quantify it. So there's a need for us to really look at a, a serious look about uh, uh, on, on what does green water constitute, how do you compute it, and how do you best manage it, and how do you really look into uh, 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 proper use using that. And, and, and I'd like this to be to frame the water food uh, nexus in this, uh, 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 in this light. And last but not least, what are the consequences for agricultural security when we would like to use these 16%. And this is a busy slide. And it's intended to be busy, and it's ended, intended to confuse you, because I'm going to quickly run through this. But here is the bottom line is, we, meaning the soil water community, has been looking at soil defined by a differential equation, by the analytics, by, by, by the mathematics. And we've ignored that there is a soil that behaves that's a living entity, shrinks and swells, that needs to be taken into consideration. And unless we really recognize that and use this as a basis of soil water management, we will fail to recognize this green water management. So there is a call here for a green water revolution that we need to look at this in a much more serious way. So here's the nexus that I'd like to call on for this morning. It's the water food nexus. And it's an access inspired by a term that many of you in this room are aware of, is water productivity. Irrigation, by the way, my background is an irrigation engineer. I had my first graduate degree was in irrigation. This is what I've, I've done many years working on irrigation systems. Irrigation is an engineering practice, and it needs to evolve into a combination of pipes and, and, and pumps into soil, but also looking into the productivity. And this is, this is an access that I'm calling for, that look into water use, productivity, energy use, emission, and more importantly, 
the impact on soil health. Soil has been ignored for many years. And by the way, this is the UN has declared this year to be the soil uh, uh, year. So we need to be looking at the impact, long-term impact on soil. Yes, we, we will be able to use the 16% coming from reuse. However, if you look at some of the changes that happen to the soil water management regimes, as a result of continued use of wastewater, brackish water, they do impact soil as we know it. So we need to be looking at those impacts very seriously and integrate them into this nexus. So the nexus I'm calling for is if I have it, the base should be the green water, which is the soil moisture, the rain-fed agriculture. This should be my base. So how much I add, and there's a cost associated with the blue water irrigation. There's a cost associated with that. There's a productivity associated with that that needs to be taken into, into consideration. There's a brackish water use where there's a cost associated with it. There's also implications on soil health as well as soil long-term impact. The same thing with, 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 uh, with, with wastewater. So this is the nexus that I'd like us to look into when it comes to water food nexus that allows us to identify, quantify by numbers a holistic system that says how much I should irrigate, what kind of quality I should be irrigating with, and at what cost. And not only the cost looking at this from a financial cost, there are many other costs, embedded costs that we need to look into, and that includes the energy, the emission, the soil, health, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and others. So this is the nexus that I'd like us to explore. That means that whatever we, we have been using in terms of the irrigation, and maximizing yield may not be the optimum when it comes at the system level. So we need to be re looking at reassessing those, those issues. So, so there is a need for a holistic platform that takes into consideration all of these factors. And I'd like, us, I'd like to introduce this nexus in that, uh, uh, from that lens, which is looking at the holistic view that allow us to quantify these interlinkages, define hotspots, and define and quantify trade-offs. There will be trade-offs among various allocations. Do I allocate for the energy sector? Do I allocate for my growing cities? Or do I allocate for the agricultural food security? And there, there, is, a, there is a nexus that needs to be looked at. Uh, now, we did talk about earlier about trade-offs. There has to be a community-based discussions about what is more important to us as a community. And there's a whole, whole host of factors that need to be looked at where the analytics I described can be the catalyst for that discussion for us to move from a conflict into a cooperation. I'd like us not to go to court to discuss these, but preemptively discuss these among the various stakeholders, including the water, the energy, the food, the climate change, and, and others, all come together to discuss criteria for moving forward in a more holistic way than we have done in the past. Uh, I will not have time to go through uh, the, the Nexus tool platform that we've been working with, but I do invite you to do so. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the, uh, it's the uh, if you could read it, wefnexustool.org, please visit that site. It has, we've added more, and I'll, I'll mention those, we've added more utility to this tool, which I'll mention in, in, a, in, a, in a minute. Uh, case studies that may be of importance, is we've we finished a case study in food security in Qatar. Maybe I'll, I'll have a chance to uh, uh, show you one slide of the output. We are actually, as we speak, talking, uh, 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 have been funded by the uh, Texas Department of Transportation looking at the hydraulic fracturing water transportation nexus in Texas, which is looking at the holistic view of the water use and the damage on road in, as a result of the, of the energy uh, exploration. Uh, we're looking at U.S.-China trade. Texas is a main, it, I wouldn't say main, but it's one of the uh, exporters of beef and, 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 uh, and uh, forage to China. And there's a trade-off there that we're exploring. Uh, I'll mention very briefly about the uh, water. We're, we're finishing a study on Texas water gap, looking at this as a spatial temporal analysis. Uh, we are engaged on a food security plan, Nexus in, in inspired in the, in the Middle East, North Africa. And we finished, uh, just finished a report on the Nexus implication on renewable energy, especially when it comes to uh, uh, off the grid uh, technology. So this came from a study that we finished in the, in, uh, for Qatar. Qatar is a, is a uh, small country. 
that in the, middle, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Arabian Peninsula that's looking at increasing its food production from 10% currently into 20%. And you could have the water you need by desalination, by desalinating the, 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 the Gulf. However, in this study, it was the land, arable land, that is a limiting factor, which is a nexus a study that we finished. Without looking at this holistically, you would have missed that. Uh, a very brief overview of the current uh, water transportation energy nexus here in the, in the Eagle Ford, where we are looking at the holistic implication of the energy exploration in the Eagle Ford. And our, uh, uh, the sustainability index that we're using is a combination of economic, social, and uh, 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 environmental indicator that allow us to look at this as a package, as a holistic, and the implications are huge. The implication could be policy changes, looking at regulation and subsidy, but also technologies. Technologies that may be looking too expensive today if we look at only cost, may be very favorable if we look at this holistically. Last but not least, consumer behavior. I was happy to hear this morning uh, Representative King talking about the, the, the conservation. We may be looking at uh, uh, more awareness when it comes to uh, consumer behavior. Once we look at the implication, once we know what, what's, what's, uh, uh, what the future is looking like. Last but not least, I'd like to mention that in the Nexus, one of the lessons we've learned that maybe all of us have known this before, but now in a quantitative term, that it's a spatial biased, spatially biased, it's temporally biased. So whatever is working for San Antonio may not work for Austin, may not work for College Station. Because these solutions, the platform are global, but the solutions are very much local. And what, she, what, what works, so there's a lever of solutions that work for different parts of the state, and I'm sure for different parts of the, of the, uh, of the nation and globally. But also, there are temporal dimensions that we need to be looking at. So if you're, if you're coming into Texas from out of state and say, oh, there's no water problem in Texas. It's raining all day. I've been delayed by two hours because of the rain. Yes, there is a temporal dimension to, this, to these issues that we need to be looking into. And, and that should be guiding our plans in terms of looking at the dynamic, spatially distributed solutions, not fixed uh, uh, plans that are, that are rigid. And that does not allow us to look into these in, in a, in a uh, uh, a uh, dynamic way. I'd like to close with a with few points that the nexus, as you could see in this room, is a multi-stakeholder approach. We need to be inclusive and we need to be uh, looking at inclusiveness both vertically and horizontally. Vertically looking at the governance of these water and energy food issues, horizontally in, in terms of thematic areas. There are no bullet solutions. There are solutions that are spatially, temporally biased, but they're local. Yet they need to be holistic, looking at all of these dimensions that I, 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 I mentioned. I'd like to acknowledge the team that has been uh, working behind the scene uh, and allowing me to be standing here and, and sharing some of these results with you. Thank you so much.